Okay, Cesar, uh, thank you for uh, giving this talk. And uh, Cesar Lupo from uh, BIMSA. Okay, Cesar, let's go. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be uh, uh, at this seminar, and I would like to thank uh, Jose Hossein for inviting me. So um, today I will talk about uh, multiple zeta values from, I'll go around multiple zeta values from uh, arithmetic to geometry and a little bit of physics, although I'm not quite an expert, but I'll give just a, a bit of a glimpse of that. So uh, multiple zeta values. So this uh, has been, I will start with two, a picture, with two pictures, in fact, um, has been a subject of great interest uh, for many, many uh, years now, like over the last uh, couple of dec dec decades, like 30 years and so. Um, so basically, if we, we want to put this into a historical perspective, it started everything with Euler, but Euler only did something around uh, single zeta values and a little bit of double zeta values. But the whole subject was revamped by these two guys that you see in the picture. So uh, Michael Hoffman and Don Zage independently. And uh, in fact, uh, like I said, since uh, Euler's work on uh, single zeta values, uh, these two guys in uh, in these in uh, those two papers. So, like I said, independently, Michael Hoffman. So he called them multiple harmonic series. But Don Zage called them uh, multiple zeta values. And in fact, uh, at first, they uh, they just want to understand what kind of uh, collinear relations are among these multiple zeta values. And I'll get back to it. Um, but then later on, it was realized that, um, well, very soon, in fact, it was realized that these numbers appear in a very different context, in, 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 even in a, a not invariant uh, Konsevich with deformation quantization, um, the theory of mixed state motives, and so on. So basically, they are pretty much everywhere you can look at. Okay, so. Multiple zeta values are um, of sometimes they're called Euler Zagier sums, are these numbers defined by this absolutely uh, convergence series. As you can see, uh, they're uh, just uh, uh, this nested series here. Um, zeta of k1, k2, kr are defined by this uh, the sum over all 1 less than n2 less than nr, or 1 over n1 to k1 times nr to kr. And of course, because we want these numbers uh, to be like convergent, to be real numbers, we impose these conditions. We want all these k1 all the way up to kr minus one to be positive integers. And of course, because we don't want anything, um, we don't want any surprises here. We impose at the last exponent to be greater or equal than two. So like I said, they converge, they converge very slowly. And um, they have pretty much, uh, connections everywhere, even uh, uh, in Galois representation theory, or even, like I said, Feynman um, integrals in quantum field theory. So we're going to call these numbers uh, multiple zeta values of weight uh, k and depth r, where, k is, where the weight k is the sum of the exponents. So obviously, for uh, r between 0 and k, there are uh, uh, um, k minus 2 choose r minus 1 multiple zeta values uh, of a given weight k and depth r. And there are two to the power of k minus two altogether. So altogether there are two to the power of k minus two. Okay, so we look at these numbers. They seem pretty uh, simple at first, but uh, you will see that um, although they look simple, they have a very, very deep meaning. And I'll uh, mention later on. But first, let's, start with, uh, let's go a little bit back in, in history, and let's look at depth in low depth. So in low depth, uh, we have the single zeta values, or uh, Riemann zeta values. Uh, so we, we can write them as zeta of k1, of uh, the sum of 1 over n1 to k1, right? Um, and the first great result uh, was achieved by Euler back in 1700. So in 1734, Euler proved that zeta of 2 is pi squared uh, over 6. So then later on, a couple of years later on, uh, Euler, uh, the same Euler proved that, uh, in fact, computed the exact values for even zeta. 
Ibn Zetas, and if uh, he expressed them, he expressed them in terms of the Bernoulli numbers. <clears throat> so these are here, uh, as you can see, you have this formula, negative one to the K minus uh, one uh, times two pi to the two K over uh, two times two K factorial times these numbers here. So these are what we call the Bernoulli numbers. These are rational numbers and all the uh, odd Bernoulli numbers starting from, um, uh, from the three uh, are zero. So these are the Bernoulli numbers. And in fact, uh, what we need to retain here is that this, the um, even zeta values are uh, pi to, to the two K times rationals. Of course, these can be computed. Uh, we can compute also um, um, zeta at negative integers. Uh, again, we can express them in terms of the Bernoulli numbers. And uh, in particular, we, we can compute the values. We can go beyond the domain. As you know, um, if we define the Riemann zeta function as a, a complex function, right? Uh, it has an analytic continuation to the whole complex plane where S equals one is a pole of residue one, but we can, so basically we can go beyond the domain and we can compute these uh, values. For example, in particular, zeta of negative one is negative one over 12. And of course we have the, uh, the trivial zeros, which uh, they can be achieved in many ways. So uh, if we want to compute the uh, zeta uh, at negative even integers, that will be what we call the trivial zeros. Other uh, values that we know, we can compute the uh, zeta of one minus two K. Uh, can be, uh, this uh, can be evaluated in terms of zeta of two K. So we can have an exact value as you can see it there. So this will involve uh, factorials uh, zeta of 2k and so on. Other values at zero we can compute is negative one half. Uh, of course, I, I wrote it twice. I don't know why. Zeta of negative one. And of course, uh, at uh, zeta of one does not exist. So like I said, for the Riemann zeta function, uh, the value one is a pole. But there is a mystery here. And um, the problem is that, that we don't know too much about these odd zeta values. So we know about even zeta values, but about odd zeta values, we don't know pretty much. We know just a little bit, and I'll uh, talk about this. So about odd zeta values, basically this is the state of the art, more or less. There are some uh, improvements here and there, but um, well, this is pretty much the most important uh, achievements. So as you know, since Lindemann, the pi is transcendental and a groundbreaking result was achieved by Roger Aperi in 1978, where he proved that zeta of three is an irrational number. But uh, we don't know if zeta of three is some kind of a rational times pi to, uh, we don't know that. So the only thing we know is that it's a, an ir irrational number. That's it. And another groundbreaking result um, was uh, by uh, Keith Ball and Tanguiri Voal in 2000. In fact, they proved that the Q vector space spanned by all zeta values is uh, infinite dimensional. In fact, they prove a qualitative result that uh, there are, for n large enough, there are um, one third times log n uh, irrational numbers among. Um, uh, all zeta values. And another result uh, of Zudilin in 2001 is that at least one of these numbers, these four numbers, zero of five, zero of seven, zero of nine, and zero of 11 is irrational. Well, the ultimate goal would be uh, to understand um, this old folklore conjecture, in fact, the transcendence conjecture, I should have said there, that the values of the Riemann zeta function at odd integers, so basically zeta of three, zeta of five, zeta of 11, and zeta and pi are algebraically independent over Q. In fact, what we want, we want to understand, so we want to understand polynomial relations among these values. And, um, among these values. And it will turn out that this will be equivalent with understanding Q linear relations among uh, multiple zeta values. We'll get to that. So this is the ultimate goal would be this uh, transcendence conjecture. Um, 
that zeta of uh, the odd zeta values and prior algebraically dependent of the So that's what basically means to it. Okay. Well, now, why are these MZVs um, so important? Well, also, uh, as, you, as I said at the beginning, they can be written as this nested sum, the nested uh, sum, uh, as you can see there. But another important fact is that we can write this as iterated intervals. This was observed by Khan Savage, but I already had a discussion with uh, Hossein, and he told me that Picard already saw this long, long, long time ago. <clears throat> so in other words, it's um, multiple zeta values, uh, but I will leave it uh, at this point as an observation made by Khan Savage, <clears throat> which basically says that the multiple zeta values uh, um, can be expressed as this iterated integral. Here, I just, mm, uh, this is integral from zero to one, but it's a gen generic integral. This does not actually converge. So what I mean by this is that I mean by over this simplex, uh, zero less than T, one less than T, R less than one. That's what I mean. So, but I wrote it just generically. And we have this uh, omega one and omega zero, these well, uh, two one forms that you see here, dz over z, and dz over uh, one minus. So like I said, this iterated integral uh, converges only if uh, at zero and one. So uh, this was the observation made by Konsevich. In other words, we can say that, um, <clears throat> that um, multiple zeta values uh, are periods, what we call periods. And I will, um, just uh, say a few words, so I'll give the definition. Um, well, I'll just give the definition of the of naive periods in the sense of uh, Konsevich and Zagia. So naive periods, what I say, uh, Konsevich in the and Zagia definition. So basically, this goes back to their paper back uh, in uh, two thousand and one. So a period is a complex number whose real and imaginary parts are uh, values of absolutely convergent um, integrals of rational functions with rational coefficients over domain in Rn given by polynomial inequalities with rational coefficients. So in other words, we can write this uh, something like this, the integral over some simplex of f of, we can have something like this. So this is what we uh, mean by period. And examples, so these are periods. And examples of periods, for example, square root of two, as you can see, we can write this as uh, the integral over uh, these domains of two x squared less than one dx. Pi was also a period, right? We can write it in this way, the integral uh, over x squared plus y squared less than one dx dy, but also, as I previously mentioned, um, thanks to Konsevich or Picard, or, uh, that zeta of two, for example, this was ob ob observed by Leibniz too. This example was observed by Leibniz. Although Leibniz uh, just called this as a nice integral representation of zeta of two. You know, back in the 1600s and 1700s, there was this uh, uh, battle who will find the exact value of zeta of two. So. Uh, Leibniz made this observation. Um, so basically, as you can see, you can recognize these uh, two one forms here. This is omega one and omega zero, right? So, but also if we want to write a double zeta value, so uh, zeta of one, two, we can write it in this way as well. So this is the, So all these here that you see here are what we call periods. Well, there are some other numbers which we don't know if they're periods. For example, other examples of periods, you can find the hypergeometric functions um, and so on. Um, but for example, we don't know if gamma, the euler mascheroni constant is a, a period or not. So we don't know that. And there is not much, much known in this ring of periods. Okay, so now the question is, uh, like I said, what kind of operations do we have with uh, in uh, 
with multiple zeta values. And let me just go very, very easy with some very, um, uh, with some baby examples, if you want. So let me just multiply two single zeta values. So for example, uh, let's multiply the series, right? Because I can do two tricks here. So I can multiply the series representation. So this is like this, for example. Right. But I can also multiply the uh, integral representation, the one that of Konsevich. So if I do, uh, if I multiply the series representation, if we have what we call the Stoffel product. So in other words, if we multiply these uh, two here, so let's say we have zeta of K2, and there is this trick, this was observed also by Euler, surprisingly. So when we multiply, imagine that you have all these values here. So this is one K1 equals K2. This is one K1 less than K2. And this is one, uh, okay, this region is one K1 greater than K2. So basically you will have, you, you will have uh, the double zeta of K1, K2 plus Z, double zeta of K2, K1, and you have when they're equal, you'll have a single zeta. So you will have the zeta of uh, K1 plus K2. So the Stoffel product, <laughs> when you multiply two single zeta values, um, you will get double zeta values, but also you get single zeta values. Um, so in this way, this is one way to generate Q-linear relations among uh, MZVs. Okay, but there is another way as well. So for example, if we want to uh, multiply, if we want to imagine, um, to, uh, the, Okay, uh, I'm just going to write here. If we want to multiply the integral representation, if we want to do that, and it's going to be a mess here, we'll get this formula. So as you can see, this is a little bit more complicated. It's like shuffling, uh, like uh, it's called a shuffle product. So it's like shuffling two decks of, uh, of, of cards together. So basically, once you do that, you have this uh, sum and you have this binomial coefficients here, but here you all only have double zeta values. You don't have any single zeta values. So you, if you want to shuffle, if you, you want to use the shuffle product for two single zeta values, you will get double zeta values. While uh, in the first case of the Stoffel product, you also get single zeta, single zetas as well. And I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, show uh, how this works through some examples. So let me give you some examples. So these two formulas, so imagine the stuff of product, just um, let's take for uh, K1 equals K2 equals two. So, um, right, we have zeta, if we uh, plug this into the stuff of product, so we will have um, zeta of two times zeta of two, right? Uh, which is two zeta of two, two plus zeta of four. You have this relation. And of course, since we know these values, we're gonna get uh, zeta of two, two is pi uh, to the fourth of 120. So it's a rational uh, multiple, uh, pi to the fourth times a rational number. But if we do the same thing with, um, with the, their integral representation, right? So for example, if we write zeta of two, uh, this iterated integral, and we shuffle everything together, guess what? We're going to obtain that uh, zeta of 2, 2 is 4 times, so we're going to have this, is 4 times zeta of 1, 3 plus 2 zeta of 2, 2. But we know zeta of 2, 2, we will know it from here, from the, um, from the stuff of product. So therefore, we can deduce that zeta of uh, combining the, uh, the stuffle and the shuffle products, we obtain that the double uh, shuffle product uh, of, so basically zeta of one, three is one fourth times zeta of four. And of course, this is also um, a rational multiple of pi to the four. So we have exact values. So these are just the simplest, simplest examples um, and as you can see, we only go up to weight four, um, but we'll go also a little bit uh, up 
in weight five. So let me give you another example. Uh, another example of shuffle product, right? So here you see I have these two one forms, but uh, in the case of you know uh, multiplying zeta of two times zeta of, of three, so again two single zeta values. One is in weight two, the other one is in weight uh, three. So I'm gonna get get double zeta values. So this is that's the thing about the shuffle plus. So this is weight two. This is weight three. And of course, we're gonna get all these are double zeta values in weight five. So this is uh, how we're gonna generate. Uh, and of course, one can compute that zeta of, when we multiply uh, the integral representation of zeta of two and zeta of three, we're gonna get these zeta of three, two plus three, uh, zeta of two, three plus six times zeta of one, four. And now you can ask, okay, uh, great, but uh, let's see, can we uh, compute these values? So, uh, the situation will get a little bit more complicated with these values. And that's why I chose this example in weight five uh, on purpose, because uh, something very, not, not very pleasant happens once we start from weight five and up, and you, I will, you will see immediately. Okay, so you see I introduced two relations now. Um, mm, I introduced the, um, the stuffle and the shuffle product, but also we can do something. We can regularize. What physicists really like is that we can allow um, the shuffle, the stuffle and shuffle uh, uh, um, to be regularized. So in other words, we can uh, remember, as I said at the beginning, that KR has to be greater or equal than two. Well, let's see if we take KR to be one, so in other words, we have the divergent multiple zeta values. So in other words, we want to regularize these values. It's something that physicists like a lot. And guess what? We can do it. So imagine with the stuff of regularization, right? We, we multiply, let's take zeta of one. We just take the simplest example. Again, single zeta values. We take zeta of one times zeta of two, and we uh, apply the, the stuff of product. If we get zeta of one, two plus zeta of two, one plus zeta of three. But we, we want to do the same thing with their integral representation. So basically we will have what we call the shuffle regularization. So we have zeta of one times zeta of two will be two times zeta of one, two plus double zeta of two, one. Okay, if we subtract these, we'll get exactly Euler's result. So this is one of the, so Euler was uh, uh, trying to, was obsessed in his uh, later in his last years, basically, in finding a formula for zeta of three. Of course, he was not, uh, not successful, but he found some relations. Um, for, for in particular, he found this uh, beautiful one that you see here. That zeta of one two is zeta of three. Of course, he didn't write. He didn't find it through this procedure of double shuffle regularization. He proved it in his own style by computing two series in two different ways, uh, and then he derived this formula. Okay, so well, there is a conjecture now that uh, all the re relations uh, among MZVs are given by this double shuffle regularized relations. If they will provide, they will give us the all, all relations. So it's still a conjecture. We don't know if that's true, but now we want to understand. Uh, what kind of Q-linear relations among as, uh, these uh, MZVs satisfy? Like I said at the beginning, we if we uh, understand Q-linear relations among MZVs, we can actually understand polynomial relations among odd zeta values. Okay, so let's start in weight. Let's in low weight, but I also I will include uh, in weight five. So in weight two, we have only one, which we know that it's a um, it, it's zeta of two. We already know the value. Uh, so it's a rational multiple of pi squared. In weight three, we have two relations, which uh, zeta of three and zeta of uh, one, two. But these two are equal. 
again, uh, proved by Euler. In width four, we have these relations. We have zeta of four, zeta of one, three, zeta of two, two, and we have a triple zeta, one, one, two. I don't know, I don't understand why it's a comma there. It should be a dot. That's it, we don't have anything else. So these linear, uh, these uh, values can, can be computed as uh, we have seen, we computed the, those two double zeta values. So zeta of four, we, we already know the value, zeta of one, three, we already know the value, zeta of two, two again. And of course, by doing the regularization, we can find, one can show that zeta of one, one, two is in fact the sum of zeta of two, two plus the sum of one, uh, zeta of one, three, which again, we already know the values. So in weight four, we all these MZVs are um, rational multiples of pi um, to the fourth. Okay, the situation will, uh, will get complicated starting from weight five. So there are six linearly independent relations among uh, the eight numbers. So in weight five, we have these eight numbers that you see. So we have zeta of five, zeta of one, four, zeta of two, three, zeta of three, two, zeta of one, one, three, zeta of one, two, two, and so on. So we have this, uh, and also we have a quadruple zeta. The thing is that all these uh, uh, MZVs in weight five can be expressed in terms of these two highlighted there in red, in terms of these double zeta values, zeta of two, three, and zeta of uh, three, two. And you will see that uh, if we want to compute these two values, uh, it will be highly non-trivial to compute them. So we want, basically we, we can, um, we suspect that these two values are somewhat uh, some combination of uh, rationals, uh, some powers of pi and zeta of three and zeta of five, but it's highly uh, non-trivial and I'll get back to it. Okay. So in terms of uh, these curinear relations, there was this conjecture made by Don Zage, um, I think in 1994, a long time ago. But first, so if we consider ZK to be the, um, the Q vector space spanned by all multiple zeta values of weight K, so the following conjecture will imply the algebraic independence of odd zeta values and pi over Q. So basically we'll have the transcendence conjecture. So Zagier's conjecture will imply the uh, transcendence. So in other words, we want to see what is the dimension of this uh, cube of this uh, vector space, Zk. So of all multiple zeta values of weight k. So it is conjectured to be equal to dk, where dk is a Fibonacci type sequence and is the coefficient from the following power series. So it's from the power series expansion of one over one minus t squared minus t cubed. So <clears throat> this conjecture, well, so far, um, we only proved that this part, and uh, this was proven by a couple of uh, people. And I will uh, explain uh, a bit about that. So let's look at this Zagier conjecture in weight five because this will be very, very interesting in weight five. So in weight five, <clears throat> we have the following <clears throat> values. <clears throat> so we have a uh, triple zeta of one, one, two is zeta of four. We can also express zeta of five in terms of the quadruple zeta of one, 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 two, and so on, and all the others. But um, and I, we can express also, um, all these values can be expressed in terms of zeta of uh, two, three, and zeta of uh, three, two. But I wrote here a relation, and as you can see here, uh, this is non-trivial. Um, is what we call the first example of non-trivial um, relations for the Hoffman, what we will call the Hoffman uh, elements. So as you can see, we have that zeta of two, three and zeta of three, two can be written in terms of uh, culinary combination of zeta of five, zeta of two and zeta of three. 
Okay, so this clearly shows that <clears throat> in weight five, D5 is less or equal than two, right? If we want D5 to be two, so in other words, for the Zagier conjecture to hold true, this will be equivalent with proving this. <clears throat> but we don't know if zeta of five is irrational. We don't know. So even for uh, K5, we don't know if the Zagier's conjecture is true. So as you can see, <clears throat> Even starting in weight five, we will uh, we get some problems. And like I said, these relations here that uh, that you see, um, and I put in a box that we can express zeta of two, three, and zeta of three, two in terms of these uh, all zeta values is highly non-trivial. And I'll explain immediately. Yeah, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to stop me at any time. So, like I said, these are the about these um, um, first non-trivial uh, rela uh, relations for the Hoffman elements. We have this theorem of Brown. <clears throat> in fact, it was a conjecture of Hoffman back in the early days of um, MZBs. In fact, I think uh, Hoffman made this conjecture in 1997. One of his papers, and Francis Brown proved it in um, in 2012. Uh, the conjecture stated that every multiple zeta values of weight k can be expressed as a collinear combination of MZVs of the same weight involving twos and threes. So the only thing we need to know is what happens to uh, MZVs in, involving twos and threes. So we can. So the argument used by Brown were motivic arguments, and um, you can find all this in his paper, which is called Mixed State Motives over Z, uh, published in the Annals um, 12 years ago. And the, only, uh, the motivic arguments used by Brown, um, well, he reduced everything to uh, to evaluating this uh, non-trivial Hoffman, um, uh, no, non-trivial um, Hoffman uh, family of Hoffman elements involving a, um, a copies of two, a single three, and then two copies of uh, b copies of two. So, in other words, these uh, I wrote it like this. So, what I mean here when I write like this, I mean zeta of two to two. So I have n copies of two. So uh, using his motivic arguments, what he can prove was that this family, this family HAB, um, so in other words, let me just write it so that, so HAB, so that it's uh, very clear. So this HAB, this family is nothing else than this, zeta of two to two, oh, right, a single three. Um, and then have B copies of two. So this is the family. Um, so what he can prove is that this is a, uh, a Q linear combination of products of, uh, of this side, pi to the two M times uh, zeta of two M plus one. You have powers of pi and all zeta values, but he needed the, in fact, a, um, an exact formula. So this came in um, paper, um, they're, they're basically published in the annals next to each other. Of Zagier uh, found the exact formula, which looks like this. So this was published in the annals as well. So the paper is called Evaluation of a Multiple Zeta Values of 2 to 2, 3, 2 to 2. Um, so as you can see, this, the formula looks pretty extraordinary, uh, although it, uh, you might have a, a sense of, uh, you might be. Uh, scared a bit, but it looks pretty nice. And <clears throat> the funny thing is that it involves the, the um, what we call the trivial Hoffman family of MZVs, which is this. Uh, I did not mention it, but uh, zeta of two, 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 so this, and 
This is n times, this is pi to the two n over two n plus one factorial. I mean, this is not the right color to pick, but it's written here as well. So in other words, Zagia found the exact formula and it's proof. So this HAB, so uh, this family of multiple zeta values, so um, you have a, a copy, two co or a copies of two, a single three in the middle, and then the, uh, B copies of two. So this fa this uh, non-trivial Hoffman family HAB is um, <clears throat> the sum, this finite sum, and you will see you have this uh, powers of pi. You have them here. These are the powers of pi, but it, they depend on the weight. And also you have the the odd zeta values here. So, but you also have these coefficients which satisfy the tuatic properties needed. Um, so you have these binomials here. So, which uh, they, Brown was unsuccessful in finding these coefficients using motivic argument. So Zagier's proof, anyway, uh, I'm not gonna go uh, in details about his proof. Uh, his proof is pretty extraordinary in the sense that it's indirect. So basically, he uh, he looks at these two entire functions, and he looks at HAB of the co as a, the coefficient of one function. So there's that, you know, and then this part here, this sum was the coefficient of the other function. He shows indirectly that uh, these two functions agree at sufficiently many points that so they can force their equality, and therefore their coefficients to be. So the proof is indirect. Um, but we managed to find another proof uh, together with uh, in a collaboration with the Lee Lai and Derek Orr. This was actually two years ago. The paper is still in, um, submitted. So, <clears throat> so we found an elementary proof of Zagius for my, in fact, we did even more. We found a, a proof for the odd counterpart, so for the, what we call multiple T values. Okay, so now, um, well, we would like to see what will go, uh, what will happen if we go further. Uh, here, I would like to mention that was the proof we found is uh, using this cotangent integrals, pretty surprising cotangent integrals. It's a direct proof. using cotangent integrals. And I will say a few words about cotangent integrals. And I'll mention a bit about these, just the formula, but I'm not gonna go into details about this cotangent integral. All right, so now we're wondering if we can go further in, in evaluating this. Um, even in a special case, for example, so I have eight copies of two and we have a something, a three or a four or whatever. And those, I don't need those uh, B copies of two. So I just want to evaluate the special family. In fact, the proof that we obtained in a collaboration with um, with uh, Lilai and Derek Orr was in fact a reminiscent of an earlier version that uh, I, I, I published before, which uh, I proved the Zagis formula in a special case. And then we use those ideas to prove it in general case. But, Somehow we couldn't manage to prove it in the general case because we didn't know this surprising cotangent. And you will see. So more generally, we are concerned about this following evaluation involving Hoffman family of MZV. So uh, let's denote this by HRA0. So like I said, we have A copies of two. We have a R there. R can be two, can be three, can be whatever integer positive. Uh, but for two, we already have the trivial family of uh, Hoffman elements. So we're interesting for r equals three, and so starting from three and on. And what so far what we uh, can prove is that we have this formula, um, which is pretty much unsatisfactory uh, for me because we have this as a rational series, and it involves this whatever multinomial coefficient, um, and I'll talk about it. It's a it's a finite sum over multi indices involving uh, zeta, odd zeta, but this is the same approach that I use for the case R equals three. 
which I was, I, it was published in 2022, well, pretty much late, but I did it way early back in 2018, actually. So we use the same ideas, but starting from R equals four, everything will get very, very complicated. But to my surprise, um, so like I said, these coefficients here multi uh, are defined in this. So as you can see them here. So um, this is at this point of work in progress. And the only thing is that we need to control this coefficient somehow. And maybe if we, can con or control this coefficient, maybe we can uh, expect to obtain evaluations for zeta of 2, 2, 2, uh, and 4, and 2, 2, 2, and 5. That would be um, amazing, even in this special case. You know, I'll explain immediately why uh, it would be amazing, even in a special case. To my big surprise, um, uh, Charlton, Stephen Charlton, and uh, Kilfi found an explicit evaluation for, um, let's call this H A4 of A, B. So I was interested, in, interested even in, <clears throat> uh, in the case of um, uh, a special case when I don't have these here. I don't have them. So, But it looks like they found the general formula even for, for this, for this family. So Zagier's formula instead of four is three. And... The formula, unfortunately, I cannot display it. I think it will take me 10 slides without any exaggeration. So I can send you to the link of the, the paper, and you can see it there on uh, two pages, uh, long formula. What I, we can say is that uh, they, found it, they found it explicitly. They use the same method as Zagier. And um, they uh, wrote this zeta of 2, 2, and a single 4 as a polynomial in double zeta values. Well, we can actually write the formula uh, modulo products. So the formula looks like this, just modulo products. I cut all the products, which is pretty much, you know. so this is how the formula would look like. As you can see, I have double zeta values. Uh, um, so the act accurate formula is like one page long, in fact, even more, and I will not reproduce it. Will not reproduce it here. And in fact, they use this formula to give further applications to multiple t values. Uh, these multiple t values what we are what we call the odd variance of MZVs. So just like the pure with zeta function is the uh, the um, in fact it's as you have the sum over one to the two m plus one to the power k. So that's the odd, but I will not go into that. Okay, I mentioned this cotangent integral, right? So the we managed to obtain a proof for Zagier's formula, this very surprising cotangent integral. And you'll be surprised if you try to compute this, um, for example, just simple like this, zero to pi over two. I, I rescaled everything here. So just by looking at this, Cotangent of x, dx. Surprisingly, this will involve odd zeta values. So, <clears throat> this cotangent integrals, uh, if we scale everything, um, like I said, we, we, we scale everything, we will have that um, this integral that you see, if we have a polynomial, let's say at zero is zero then we can write this as, well, modulo some logs and pies. We will have this ratio. We will have the sums involving the ratio, this ratio here. Zeta of 2k plus one over pi to the 2k plus one. So we'll have it here. That's very surprising. And in fact, in a recent uh, joint work, another colleague of mine from BIMSA, we use this cotangent integral to find some approximation type methods for the, uh, for the odd zeta values. So it's a pretty much useful. And in fact, uh, it has some connections. It, it, it's not surprising. It looks surprising at first, but it actually is not surprising. <clears throat> um, but 
It looks pretty extraordinary. And we use this, it was an essential ingredient in the proof of Zagier's formula. Okay, so now we're wondering, starting from this cotangent integral, what kind of properties? So basically from Zagier's formula, what kind of arithmetic properties we have? Hmm. And I'll, you'll be surprised. So up to this point is not known. So we don't know anything about this ratio. We don't know if it's uh, rational even for a single k. We don't know that. But moreover, it, was, it is conjectured that all these numbers are transcendental, right? So, um, but the irrationality of this ratio is, it turns out to be equivalent to what we uh, call the Chola-Milner conjecture, which says that for any positive integer k, these numbers that you see there, so these are the curvid zeta uh, function, zeta of k uh, a over q, right, are linearly independent over q. So in other words, in, a, um, in some uh, previous work of Gunn, Murti, and Pat, basically they reduced this, um, um, show that the Chola-Milner conjecture for the single modulus k equals four is equivalent of, with proving the irrationality of, uh, of this ratio, zeta of two k plus one over pi to the two k plus one for all positive integers k greater than one. Wow, that's pretty uh, interesting. Um, because it seems to be out of reach at this point, but so it looks like they're equivalent. But I will tell you what kind, what Zagas formula from MCVs will give us in terms of these um, and what we want to prove, what we will be our best hopes, be, the best scenario to, to show. So, Zagier's formula for H A B, uh, we will give us some weak but non-trivial arithmetic property. In fact, it will give that there are infinitely many positive integers k such that this ratio here, as you can see, is not what we want. We want that factorial, k factorial, the two to the k to disappear. But it looks like this is the most we can prove that this ratio is not an integer. And the best thing was to um, to show the weak version, what we call the weak version of Chola-Milner conjecture, which basically says that the set, um, this ratio z of 2k plus one over pi to the 2k plus one contains infinitely many rational. So at this point, even this would be out of reach for us. Uh, well, uh, so, okay. So these are the arithmetic part of this. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, I don't know uh, when we started. You're muted. Huh? I'm still muted. Wait. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh -huh. I, I was talking with and I realized that it's not. Uh... Okay, so I think you can go more uh, eight minutes, seven minutes. Is okay, that... I'll, I'll go a bit uh, faster. So towards geometry, um, also um, in geometry, so I'll go uh, faster here. So you know, if we look at Dirichlet, uh, if we want to look at the eigenvalues of the uh, Dirichlet uh, uh, operator, so you have the negative Laplace of u equals lambda u, u is in lambda, so with uh, and u is zero on the boundary. So we know from uh, reed fredholm theory for compact operators that this has a discrete spec uh, spectrum. So we, we have a sequence of eigenvalues and which is increasing and moreover the lambda n is uh, goes to infinity. So the question is, we're wondering what kind of asymptotic estimates or inequalities do we have for this lambda case? Okay, so this is some well-known facts that we can have some uh, asymptotic estimates for uh, for the number of, uh, of eigenvalues. So we, uh, we denote this by n lambda, so we can evaluate, we, uh, we have an asymptotic estimates in terms of uh, uh, the volume of the unit ball. So in other words, we have this kind of uh, asymptotic estimates. This is the theorem of, of whale. Uh, and moreover, uh, whale's law, um, asymptotic law, will imply that on average, we have this here. And by the way, this was proven by Yao and Li and um, uh, Sean that we have this inequality, but anyway. Okay. So for fixed n, um, 
the faber kran inequality asserts that the minimum, if we take the first eigenvalue of, uh, of the omega, of the domain omega, uh, and let's say we have a domain of area uh, pi, so the minimizer of this first eigenvalue is the uh, exactly obtained when, when we have, uh, when the domain is uh, the disk. And this happens in R, R2. So the theorem of uh, faber kran is more general and it says that we suppose that we have a lambda, uh, 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 sorry, an omega or domain, which is bounded with a smooth boundary. And then we have these, these inequalities. So lambda one will be greater or equal than lambda one of the uh, omega star when omega star is the geodesic ball in Rn. So this will be the minimizer. So in particular is exactly what we have for R2. Okay. So, um, there is a conjecture, uh, a faber kran inequality of um, we, when we take the domain when we were to be a regular polygon, let's say Pn of area pi. So it's a conjecture of Poya and Sego, which basically says that lambda one uh, of omega is greater or equal than lambda one of the regular polygon. So as n approaches infinity, we expect that this uh, will approach in R2, for example, that lambda one of Pn will approach the lambda one of uh, uh, in the disk. So more precisely, we will have an asymptotic estimate of the following type. So uh, if we take the ratio of the eigenvalues of the regular polygon and the disk, we will have this asymptotic estimates. And we are wondering what are these coefficients? So we want to determine them. Okay, so uh, there are some results. Uh, for um, i equals one, if for from i going from one to four, all of them are zero except for i equals two, which this coefficient will uh, imply will will be equal to four zeta uh, zeta of three. Exactly. So, um, but also it is known that the uh, the first eigenvalue of the disk is j01 squared, which this is the first non-trivial zero of the first uh, vessel of the vessel function of the first kind, which is defined uh, as this series. And in this case, we can determine for i5 and i6 uh, co the coefficients. And you can see they will involve zeta of five and zeta of three squared. So these odd zeta values start appearing in this uh, expansion, this power series expansion. In fact, in 2021, very, very recently, there was this groundbreaking paper of uh, these guys of uh, Berghaus, Georgiev, Monian, and Rachenko. Uh, probably you have heard of Daniel Rachenko in a different context. So basically, they proved that the Dirichlet in um, the eigenvalues of the Dirichlet problem have an, uh, have an asymptotic expansion of this form. And these coefficients here that you see, right? They have this first uh, eigenvalue of the unit disk are polynomials whose, uh, so these CNs are polynomials whose coefficients belong to the, sm uh, the space of multiple zeta values of weight n. So these coefficients, in fact, they're multiple zeta values, single valid uh, MZVs. So in the case of the regular uh, polygon, um, and moreover, so this is what they prove to be more uh, specific. Um, so moreover, the, they computed explicitly these coefficients Cn all the way up to 14. So from one to 14, they computed. So we, they have this, it's pretty extraordinary that uh, they could do that. Cesar, um, what is the tilt It is. Uh... I mean, the one uh, the lambda k is equivalent to this one. What what it is exactly it means? Say that again. Uh, this uh, in the first equation. Ah. I mean, when you say tilde, what what do you exactly mean? Or this uh, equivalent or which we were here in the slide or no? It is the, the, the same slide. The same slide. The, the first equation. Ah, this one is the, yes. This is the uh, ah is this uh, asymptotically equivalent to this. So it's the same type of thing. So depending on which variable, uh, just a moment. Uh, uh, for n, for n goes to infinity. Ah, okay, okay. So, okay, okay. 
So basically, they proved that there exists a sequence of polynomial Cn, right, in this space of multiple zeta values of weight n. And we have this, uh, this expansion. And they compute actually the coefficients all the way up to 14. That's pretty extraordinary. Um, anyway, so this is the. So the polynomial Kn are the same for all k, right? Say that again. So the claim that for all k, that there's the same polynomial Cn. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um. Yeah, so the, you can find the paper on archive, uh, hasn't been published yet, but uh, yeah, it's a, I think it's a great groundbreaking result. Okay, and now a little bit towards quantum field theory. I know I'm moving around, uh, which, which here I'm not quite an expert, so I'll go pretty quickly. Um, so this was in 1995. So I will apologize to the physicists around here. Um, Brothers, David Brothers and Kramer conjectured that um, uh, a formula for amplitudes, so or a family of graphs in phi four, and they call these graphs zigzag graphs. So they're wondering if we take the periods of these zigzag graphs, how do they look like? And um, well, the Zn, we denote Zn to be the zigzag graph with n loops and uh, zero external momenta. And basically, they associated the period of this Zn, which is this uh, integral, right, that you see here. And um, of course, this uh, uh, psi squared of Zn is, uh, is there will be a polynomial. Um, and this integral will be over this uh, simplex, alpha 1, alpha 2n. So this will be in the uh, uh, the standard com uh, coordinate simplex, right? Which is uh, denoted by this, right? And this is uh, psi of Zn is a uh, the graph which is a polynomial in of Zn. So basically, uh, there was a conjecture by Brothurst, which he said that this uh, period um, given by this convergent integral in the projective space. Is uh, can be expressed in terms of uh, odd zeta values, and in 2015, Brown and Schnetz proved this zigzag conjecture. In fact, they found the exact formula for this, which is looks like this. So, if we look at this integral, basically it is equal to this formula. Uh, and in fact, this uh, relies again on uh, heavily on uh, Zagier's formula for a H A B. Um, yeah. All right, I think I will stop here. Thank you very much.